good morning and welcome to worship at the Wallace Presbyterian Church in Wallace, North Carolina. My name is Philip Gladden and I'm the pastor here at the church. We're so glad that you're joining us through our live streaming while we have to be apart. Today is Trinity Sunday on the church calendar and our music and our scriptures will help us think about that great mystery which at its heart is all about our relationship with God and by extension, our relationship with one another. Blessed are the people of God who are deeply aware that they are both called and addressed by the triune God. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit who gathers, protects, and cares for the church through the word and the spirit, a God of splendor and majesty, revealed perfectly in Jesus Christ, who is the image of the invisible God. And blessed is the community of faith that gratefully acknowledges that the triune God not only receives our worship, but also makes our worship possible, promoting us through the Holy Spirit and sanctifying our offerings through the perfect priesthood of Jesus Christ, who during his life on earth offered praise to the Father full of joy in the Holy Spirit, and ever now lives to pray for us. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost. Again, welcome. So glad you're here with us today. A few announcements. There will be two Bible studies this week via Zoom, tomorrow night from 7 to 8, and then Wednesday morning from 10 to 11. You can check your email from, for the Zoom invitations. If you are not receiving emails from our church and would like to, please contact the church office. I have a couple of notes that have come in the mail for the congregation. The first is from Elizabeth Sills, who was one of our high school graduates. Dear Wallace Presbyterian Church family, thank you for the Bible I received for graduation. This church has been such a large part of my life growing up, and I am so grateful for the love and support of my church family as I enter this next chapter of my life in college. Love, Elizabeth Sills. And the other is from Judy Robinson, and her caregiver, Deborah, says, WPC, if Jesus forgave those who nailed him to the cross, and if God forgives you and me, how can you withhold your forgiveness from someone else? Peace and love from Judy and Deborah. And Judy's, Deborah's note is, hope all is well. Judy is doing okay, still watching her TV shows. I'm glad to hear from Judy. Uh, today we receive our quarterly PATH offering, which stands for the Presbyterian Answer to Hunger. This offering supports the hunger program of the Presbytery of Coastal Carolina, which in turn supports feeding programs for children in Haiti and the African country of Malawi, but also supports congregational feeding ministries such as our Helping Hands Food Pantry. Just this past week, we've submitted a grant request to the Presbytery and also an emergency grant request from the, to the Presbytery for funds as our food pantry remains open during the coronavirus pandemic and works in concert with Duplin Christian Outreach Ministries. Thank you for your ongoing support of the PATH offering and of our food pantry. And finally, as always, thanks to Carla Castine and Vera Simpson for the music today and for Bill Butler for his expertise in bringing this live stream worship to you. I invite you to join me in the opening sentences as we begin worship the words will be on the screen. Gathered in the name of Jesus Christ, inspired by the Holy Spirit, and blessed by God, we come to worship one holy God. O God, our own God, how wonderful is your name in all the earth. Your majesty is the music of the starry skies, yet even children of dust can sing your praises. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we let our gratitude and joy be made known. O God, our own God, how wonderful is your name in all the earth. Our opening hymn is Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty.
Beloved children of God, we celebrate in the faith the sacrifice of Jesus Christ once and for all for the sins of the whole world. God has reconciled us to himself and to one another. God has covenanted with us by the presence of the Holy Spirit who gathers us together and transforms us to new life. Let us repent from our sins and may the mercies of the Lord inspire us to wholeness and grace. I invite you to join me in the unison prayer of confession, time of silent prayer, and our assurance of pardon. Let us pray. Great God of all creation, who are we that you are mindful of us? You who set the stars in motion, who launched waves crashing against the shore, who knows the heights and depths of the world, why do you bother with us? You count the hairs on our heads and call us each by name. You give us your wisdom and you uphold us by your spirit. You tend to us and care for us and we do not understand why. We cannot grasp your love for us, O oh God, for it is unlike us to be that loving and forgiving. We become enmeshed by our own needs and wants and desires and we fail to see beyond anything but our own little circles. Turn us around, O God. Help us to see as you see and to reach out as you reach out. Remind us once again of the sacredness of our ordinary day-to-day -day lives. By your Spirit, teach us to live truly as beings little lower than angels. In your mercy, O God, forgive who we are and bless who we will be. Lord, hear our prayers. Friends, hear this great good news. God continually shows us another way. God's mercy is as wide as the ocean. God's desire to forgive is as strong as the mighty wind. So let our hearts receive the outpouring of God's love through the Holy Spirit. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Let us sing God's praises for his mercy in our lives. This week when I was out and about doing a few things, I had the chance to see Jack and Miller and Harper Jane just for a few minutes and it was so good to see them and it made me realize how much I miss seeing all the rest of you. So I look forward to when we can all be back together again and you can come up for the children's sermon. I brought some pictures to show you again today. I wanna to show you a picture That's a picture of my father when he was about 17 years old. I think when he was graduating from high school. And then this is a picture of my father when he was about 22 years old and he was just finishing college and he's got his college sweater on with a letter for the college he went to. And then here's a picture of my father and my mother. And that's a picture of my father not long before he died. He died a long time ago. And he was um, only about, he was 62 years old when he died. And if he was still alive, he would be 100 years old this year. Um, so in that picture, he's younger than I am now, which is really kind of hard to believe. But the reason I brought those pictures to show you is Miss Nancy showed this picture to somebody one time, and they said, oh, that's a great picture of Phil. When was that taken? And Nancy just laughed. 
because people always say that I look so much like my father. One time a few years ago when I went down to see my mother in Georgia, when I walked in her room, she said, you look just like your father, which was a really nice thing to hear. But an even better thing to hear is when people say, you remind me of your dad because of the way you act and the things that you do because of the kind of person he was and we can see him in the things that you do and that you believe and the way you do things. We, we can see your dad in you. And that's a really wonderful thing to hear. And I try to live like that so that he would be proud of me. And the reason I tell you that is I brought some other pictures. Now, these aren't real pictures. These are just drawings that somebody did. And here's a picture that somebody thought maybe Jesus looked like. Now, you know, we don't know what Jesus looked like because there weren't any cameras or nobody ever painted a picture of Jesus when he was alive. But maybe that's a picture like you usually see of Jesus. Or sometimes you might see a picture that looks like this. Here's when he's holding the lamb. It kind of looks like the same, sort of like the same picture. But here's a very different picture that really kind of surprises people sometimes because that's what somebody that lived back when Jesus lived where he lived might have looked like. And if Jesus looked like everybody else, that might be what Jesus looked like. But we don't know because we don't have any pictures of Jesus. But one thing we do know is that Jesus said, if you have seen me, you have seen God. You have seen my Father. Now, Jesus did not mean that God looked like this, or this, or this, because God doesn't look like us. What Jesus meant was, when you see the things that I do and how I live, then that's who God is. When you see me healing people and feeding people and forgiving people of their sins and loving people, and reaching out to people. That's who God is. That's the way God is. So it's like we could say of Jesus, well, you know, when we see Jesus, we, we can see his Father through him because he's doing the things that his Father did. And that's a wonderful thing to know because we can't see God and we don't know what God looks like, but we know who God is and what kind of God we have because Jesus has showed us what kind of heavenly father we have. Let's have a prayer together. Dear God, we thank you that you loved us so much. You sent Jesus as your son to be our savior. We thank you that he shows us who you are, the kind of God you are, loving and forgiving and powerful and healing and comforting. Lord, help us to live the same way since we are your children so that people can say, well, when we see you, we see God and what God is doing. We pray in his name. Amen. Look forward to seeing you again. I invite you to join me in our unison prayer for illumination. The words will be on the screen. We pray this prayer each week to ask God to prepare our hearts and minds to hear his word. So let us pray. Holy, 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 merciful, eternal, and mighty God, by your grace you have shown us who you are, one in three and three in one. We glorify you as Trinity, even as we worship you in your unity. Open our hearts to receive your word to us today, that not only in our worship, but in our lives, we may serve and reflect your triune love all our days. Amen. Our Old Testament lesson is Psalm 8. It might sound familiar because of the prayer of confession we just prayed. It was based on Psalm 8. In my Bible, the heading is Divine Majesty and Human Dignity. 
I invite you to hear God's word. O Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouths of babes and infants, you have founded a bulwark because of your foes to silence the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you have established, what are human beings that you are mindful of them, mortals that you care for them? Yet you have made them a little lower than God and crowned them with glory and honor. You have given them dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under their feet, all sheep and oxen and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the air and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the sea. O Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Our next hymn is God Whose Giving Knows No Ending. Our gospel lesson is from Matthew, the last five verses of his gospel. After Jesus was raised from the dead before he ascended into heaven, he sent word to his disciples by the women to go to Galilee and that he would meet them there. And the story from Matthew takes place on the mountain in Galilee. In Matthew, Jesus spends a lot of time up on the mountain teaching and praying and um, talking to his disciples. You might know these verses as the Great Commission, but I invite you to hear the Word of God. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. May God bless the reading and our hearing of his holy word. Let us pray. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. 
Carol Steen and I made a deal several years ago. Whenever we are going to sing, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty in worship, or Carla and Vera are going to play an arrangement, I am to notify Carol ahead of time. That way, Carol says, she'll know to bring extra tissues to worship that day. That's how meaningful the hymn is to her and to many others. Last Sunday morning, before worship, Carol was here to sing, and I found her, and I told her we were going to sing Holy, Holy, Holy this Sunday, even though we sang it just three weeks ago. Carol, I said, next Sunday is Trinity Sunday, and there's no way we can worship on Trinity Sunday without singing Holy, 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 God in three persons, Blessed Trinity. Carol then told me she had recently received two separate emails from friends, both of which ended with reference to the Father and to the Son and in the Holy Ghost. Well, have you ever heard that story? It goes like this. While walking along the sidewalk in front of his church, a minister heard a child's voice solemnly intoning a prayer. Apparently, his five-year-old son and his playmates had found a dead robin. And feeling that a proper burial should be performed, they found a small box and some cotton batting, and they put the bird's body in the box. Then they dug a hole and got ready to bury the deceased. The minister's son was chosen to say the appropriate prayers. With great dignity, he prayed his version of what he thought his father always said. Glory be unto the Father, and to the Son, and into the hole he goes. Well, as an aside, I had one of those God wink moments again this week as I emailed Carol to ask about sharing the Holy, Holy, Holy story. While I was concentrating on emailing Carol and then looking for something in my papers, I had music playing on Spotify on my computer. And suddenly I realized what was playing, a jazz arrangement of Holy, Holy, Holy by Rick Gallagher. Today is Trinity Sunday on the church liturgical calendar. Trinity Sunday focuses on a doctrine of the church rather than on an event, such as the birth or the death or the resurrection of Jesus. And as described on the Presbyterian Church USA website, it celebrates the unfathomable mystery of God's being as a holy trinity. It is a day of adoration and praise of the one eternal incomprehensible God. The triune God is the basis of all we are and do as Christians. In many ways, preaching on Trinity Sunday is a daunting task. After all, preaching on a doctrine hardly seems as exciting as preaching from a gospel story. And then there is the whole challenge of trying to steer away from some kind of logical or rational or philosophical explanation of the Trinity, although many scholars and preachers, including me, have attempted to do that over the years. But when you do that, you end up violating that cardinal rule that when you find yourself in a hole, you stop digging. Even the great Methodist theologian Charles Wesley had this to say about understanding the Trinity. Bring me a worm that can comprehend a man, and I will show you a man that can comprehend the triune God. But that's the thing about God, isn't it? Because God has made himself known to us through his son Jesus Christ, and in the power of the Holy Spirit, we can't help but want to know God better, and in turn to describe who God is. But whenever we try to describe God with our human language, we inevitably come up short. The great writer T.S. Eliot is probably best known today for writing the poetry collection on which Andrew Lloyd Webber based his Broadway musical Cats. Eliot had a conversion experience in 1927 from Unitarianism into Anglicanism. And he described his religious views as a combination of a Catholic cast of mind, 
a Calvinist heritage and a puritanical temperament. His religious faith played a very important role in his later writings and poetry. From 1936 to 1943, Eliot published what he considered to be his most significant work and what many consider to be his masterpiece, a collection of poems called Four Quartets. The poems deal with questions of life and death, time and eternity, the incarnation, and spiritual revelation. The poems have been described as the poet's clearest exposition of his Christian beliefs. In the first poem, which is called Burnt Norton, Eliot writes about the limits of our human comprehension and our human language when it comes to knowing God. You can hear his biblical allusions in his description. He writes, words strain, crack, and sometimes break under the burden, under the tension, slip, slide, perish, Decay with imprecision will not stay in place, will not stay still. Shrieking voices, scolding, mocking, or merely chattering always assail them. The word in the desert is most attacked by voices of temptation, the crying shadow in the funeral dance, the loud lament of the disconsolate chimera. So it is when we try to explain and rationalize the concept of God, the three in one, our words crack and strain and sometimes break under the burden. And yet we persist and we raise our voices to sing, holy, 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 Lord God almighty. And we baptize in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And why do we do it? We do it because God has made himself known to us as three in one, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Not to make our lives hard, not to confuse our minds, not to hide from us behind some incomprehensible doctrine. And because God has made himself known to us as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, he has revealed who God is. It's been said, if this is God, then thus is God. Think about that for a minute. The disciples were faithful Jews raised on the bedrock belief of the Lord our God, the Lord alone. And yet when they came to know Jesus and saw who he was and what he was about and began to trust that indeed in Jesus of Nazareth, God was dwelling, they could have said, if this is God, then thus is God. And when the disciples experienced the rush of the Holy Spirit in wind and fire on Pentecost and felt the power of the Spirit in their lives to be, in fact, Jesus' presence, sending them out to be witnesses to the end of the earth, they could have said, if this is God, then thus is God. In other words, even if there isn't a fully developed doctrine of the Trinity anywhere in the New Testament, much less the Bible as a whole, our foundational belief in God, the three in one, has its deep roots in the relationship God chose to have with his people and continues to have with his people. As a God who creates, who cares, who redeems, who saves, who calls us to walk with him in the paths of righteousness and to take the good news with us wherever we go. One person has rightly said that the idea of the Trinity is not optional because it describes the very nature of God. It is who God is. You might very well have heard the story about the kindergarten teacher who was walking around the classroom observing the students while they were drawing. She stopped at the desk of one little girl who was working hard on her drawing. The teacher watched for a minute then asked what the girl was drawing. The girl said, I'm drawing God. The teacher paused and said, but no one knows what God looks like. Without missing a beat or looking up from her drawing, the little girl said, they will in a minute. I don't know that I'm quite as confident as that little kindergarten girl, but I am confident in saying that the Trinity, 
Father, Son, and Holy Spirit tells us who God is. And actually, it is more correct and more personally meaningful and relevant to say that the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit shows us who God is. For you see, at its heart, the doctrine of the Trinity is all about love and relationship. And if that still sounds too philosophical, think about it this way. The doctrine of the Trinity is our very human attempt to describe in words, words that sometimes crack and strain and even break under the burden, but words to describe the majesty and the glory and the grace and the mercy and the self-giving love and the awesome power that we have come to know through God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. One Presbyterian theologian has summed up the importance of the Trinity in our lives, not in technical theological language, but in terms of what we believe when times are hard, how particularly relevant his words are right now. He writes, when dramatic events occur in our lives, we find out what we really believe. When our hopes are crushed, or when we reflect on an enormous tragedy such as the tsunami, today we would say the coronavirus pandemic and the boiling over of racial tensions. When we reflect on tragedies such as these, we discover which parts of the creeds and confessions we recite in church are essential in our lives. What guides our faith in such situations? How do we bring comfort and hope to others? What do we really believe? He writes, the Apostle Paul might have said, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who consoles us in all our affliction, for just as the sufferings of Christ are abundant for us, so our consolation is abundant through Christ, sealed in our hearts through the power and constant presence of the Holy Spirit. He writes, John Calvin might have said, Christ is not only the pledge of our adoption, but God also gives us the Holy Spirit as a witness to this adoption through whom we may freely cry aloud, Abba, Father. Whenever we are distressed, remember to ask for the presence of the Spirit who will enable us to pray boldly. And he writes, but we might say, be comforted, for God is always with you which is exactly the promise Jesus makes in the very last verse of Matthew's gospel. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. That is the same promise the angel brought to the Joseph in a dream back at the beginning of Matthew's gospel. When Matthew tells us that all this took place to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet, look, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel which means God is with us. Think about that. In all of life, and especially when times are hard, God is with us through the presence of the risen Lord Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit. God isn't present with us as a philosophical idea or a general natural force or an unknowable deity. God is always with us, always with us as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. God is with us when we are sent out to make disciples of all nations, when we baptize in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and when we teach people all that Jesus has shown us about who God is. The heart of the Trinity is relationship and love, and it is from that relationship and love that Jesus gives us our commission as his disciples. Robert Cornwall writes, our calling, our commission then, is to draw others into this relationship. We preach, we disciple, we baptize, and in the course of this work, God draws humanity into God's self, transforming all, and this is a task that transformed time as we know it. But the promise is there. Jesus will be present with us and to us to the end of the age. Thank God for the Trinity. 
for knowing who God is as we seek to respond faithfully to his call. Thank God that as he sends us out to do God's work, we go with the promise that God, the three in one, is always with us. Let me finish today's sermon with another lectionary poem by Andrew King called The Commissioned. And as you listen to the words, be reminded of who God is and who God is calling us to be, the commissioned. At first it feels like a circle closed, a journey completed. This reminder of the mountain where Peter, James, and John saw the Lord transfigured, speaking with Elijah and Moses, the voice that thundered from the enclosing cloud, filling the disciples with fear. It is Christ himself who speaks to us here, the Lord crucified and now resurrected, proclaiming his authority, and for a moment the apostles might be tempted to think the mission surely is accomplished, goal achieved. God reigning through Christ. And perhaps the 11 look around the peak to see if Moses and Elijah will again appear for congratulatory clasps of the hand. But the circle has not closed. The journey has not finished. It is open-ended as the arching sky and as the road below that leads to the distant horizon. Open as the mission that here Christ gives us as the promise he makes to be always with us from now to the end of days. For disciples must be made in and from every nation, taught Christ's ways and words, and sent anew to serve the men and women of the earth. See how the slanting sun moving across these Galilean hills takes its seat on the rim of the wider world, inviting our eyes to seek not the shades of prophets past, but the shimmer of the new world to come. See how as we lift our heads in the gaze that follows Christ lifting from the earth, we discover no mystifying cloud, nor faces from only scriptural glory. Rather see the shapes of the yet to be appearing in the echoes of his words. There we see Paul in conversation with Peter. And there is Barnabas and Phoebe and Lydia speaking with Thomas, who will travel to India. And we see Boniface and Patrick and Columba standing beside Francis and John and Charles a little further over. Dorothy Ripley, who labored for slaves in America. Mary Slessor, who served so faithfully in Nigeria. Elizabeth Fry, who did her work close to home. Just a few among hosts of other men and women come to the summit hearts receiving Christ's commission for them whose long shadow shine, but in whose shadow, look, just over here, stands another familiar figure who, like them, will be helping to reshape the world that so needs our obedience to Christ's love. Yes, it is you. Let us pray. Loving God, we are limited in our understanding of you, but we know that you care for us and for all creation. Thank you for loving us and remaining with us in our sorrows and joys. Thank you for the life of Jesus, whose life shows us the way to life and happiness and trust. Thank you for your spirit who leads us Warm our hearts and unite us that we might open our lives to you to accept all your love and to respond to it by entrusting ourselves to you with all that you have made us and given us. We ask this in the name of Jesus the Christ. Amen. have a joy and a number of concerns to share with you today and as I did last week I hope that we can use a little bit of live air 
to offer our silent prayers as we are all carrying so many thoughts and burdens and concerns in our lives. A great joy to share with you is that on Friday evening right here in the sanctuary, Jenny Lee Wells and Gus Aratakis were married and it was a wonderful celebration with a family and just a few friends. And we wish Jenny Lee and Gus much happiness in their married life. Quite a few concerns to share with you and ongoing prayers. We share our sympathy with Bill and Susan Walters and their family on the death of Bill's brother, Al Elgin, late Tuesday night. Al lived out at River Landing and had been worshiping with us here since moving to Wallace. Reverend Jim Atwood was the minister here right out of seminary after doing an internship here in the late 1950s, early 1960s. Much beloved, uh, dear friend of folks still in this congregation. He is in uh, poor health in Virginia, and we lift Jim and his wife Roxana up in our prayers. Texted with Joe Tillman, who tells me he's improving every day, getting stronger, and is now able to walk with a cane. Harvey Knowles is home now, recovering from neck surgery to repair a ruptured disc on Friday. He is doing well. Andrea Castine is home from Duke Hospital after being treated for a lung infection. We pray for Hill Lanier and his family. Hill will begin radiation treatments on his brain and spine on Wednesday for four to six weeks in Chapel Hill. We continue to pray for Arnie Young, who continues with treatments for his lymphoma. We lift up prayers from Maud Farlow from the Rockfish Presbyterian Church, who is in increasingly poor health. Just before coming in for worship, I got a text from my brother who lives down in New Orleans, and he and his wife are hunkering down for Cristobal, which is getting ready to hit the Gulf Coast. They live in a condo about 40 yards from Lake Pontchartrain. He said the winds are up to about 36 miles an hour and the waves are up over the rocks on the lake. Fortunately, they live on the fifth floor. We pray for everyone in the path of the storm. We pray for our partners in Tabasco that was lashed by the winds and the floods from this storm so early in the season. Continue to carry concerns and prayers for everyone affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. I'm sure you're following it as closely as I am. And our hearts are heavy that we now have close to a thousand cases in Duplin County, which ranks us number seven in the state of North Carolina. So let us continue to pray for our leaders as they make decisions for people who are affected by this illness, uh, either as caregivers or professionals, care providers or patients themselves. This week I read a comment that someone had written that said this time right now is what our faith has always prepared us for. And it was kind of like what it talked about the meaning of the Trinity. What is it that we believe? What is it that gets us through difficult times? And it just seems like the perfect storm, even with Cristobal coming with the pandemic and the racial unrest. Let us continue to lift up our country and the situations before us. I think about the poem that I just read about the disciples not looking back to the horizon to look at the past, but to look at the what might be to come. Somebody has asked me, is this all God's judgment on us? I don't know that I'm in a position to make that call, but I think it is a time and opportunity for collective and individual reckoning. Do we need to return to the way things were or strive for a better way in all of life? And I think the answer is the latter. And one other thing I wanted to share with you, just because so much has pricked my thoughts and my imagination and my conscience, um, 
read two interesting comments on the whole idea of Black Lives Matter from two colleague minister friends where there's pushback on that topic and that phrase, Black Lives Matter, but all lives matter, which is true. But two different comments, both from stories that Jesus told. One friend said, well, remember the shepherd that had a hundred sheep and one went missing. And the 99 said, all sheep matter. And the shepherd said, that's true. And this one sheep needs my attention right now. And the other pastor said, the prodigal son's brother said, all sons matter. And the loving father said, that's true. But this one son needs my attention and love right now. I hope we can grasp this opportunity in our prayers and in our actions and in our hearts to seek God's righteousness in our world. Let us go to the Lord in prayer, in silence, lifting up all the concerns and the joy, searching our own hearts, and concluding with the Lord's prayer. Let us pray. Hear our prayers, O Lord. Incline your ear to us and grant us your peace. We ask these things in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We come to a time of offering our gifts to God. Thank you for your continued faithful support of the ministries of this church, and for your support of the Path Hunger Offering. As I've said each week, if you're worshiping with us via the live stream and you regularly attend another church, I encourage you to support the ministries of your church. But let us bring our offerings to God.
Let us pray. Almighty God, we offer our gifts in gratitude this morning, not just for what you do in our lives, but for who you are in our lives. You are with us in the person of the Father, the God above us. You come to meet us as the Son, as God beside us. You empower us to do the work of the kingdom by the Holy Spirit, God within us. You provide strength and boldness that we would never find on our own. Lord, may these gifts be tools that make the transformation of the world a reality. We pray in the name of one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Our affirmation of faith will be printed on the screen. It's taken from sections of a declaration of faith from the Presbyterian Church USA. Please join me. We believe in one true and living God. We acknowledge one God alone whose demands on us are absolute, whose help for us is sufficient. That one is the Lord whom we worship, serve, and love. We acknowledge no other God. We must not set our ultimate reliance on any other help. We must not yield unconditional obedience to any other power. We must not love anyone or anything more than we love God. We praise and enjoy God. To worship God is highest joy. To serve God is perfect freedom. We affirm that Jesus was born of woman, as is every child, yet born of God's power, as was no other child. In the person and work of Jesus, God himself and a human life are united, but not confused, distinguished, but not separated. The coming of Jesus was itself the coming of God's promised rule. Through his birth, life, death, and resurrection, he brings about the relationship between God and humanity that God always intended. The Holy Spirit is God active in the world. By the Spirit, God raised up leaders and prophets in Israel. By the Spirit, Jesus was conceived, baptized, and empowered. By the Spirit, the risen Christ is present with his church. We affirm that the Holy Spirit is the Lord and giver of life, the renewer and perfecter of God's people, the one who makes real in us what God has done for us. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, God in three persons, blessed Trinity. Our closing hymn is, Lord, you give the great commission.
grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with all of you. Amen.